another episode of the William Branham Historical Research Podcast. I'm John Collins, the author and the founder of William Branham Historical Research at william-branham.org. And with me, I have my co-host, researcher, minister, and friend, Charles Paisley, the founder of ChristianGospelChurch.org. And together, we're examining the history and the intersections in history between William Branham and other key figures that either influenced or were influenced by the post-World War II healing revivals. Charles, I'm excited about today. We had such an exciting experience last week, and um, for the listeners who aren't aware of everything that goes on behind the scenes, we actually had to halt production and we're inserting an episode right in the middle of our plan strategy of episodes. Yeah, I know. I, we got talking last time about Mr. Wathen, and I, I know uh, a few of the things we said on the call, we decided to actually fact check ourselves. And I know you went out to Mr. Wathen's house. Uh, we, we just wanted to make sure we weren't, uh, we weren't crazy. <laughs> yeah. Of course, we got out there and surprise, surprise, we weren't. <laughs> Unbelievable. For the viewers who are watching this on YouTube, there is, uh, in the background of when we're talking, you're going to see the video of the trip that I made down to Wathen's place, but it it was a surprise to me because you were mentioning something that, a fact that I did not know, I did not realize that he said he was on the hill looking and he could see where the bridge was. And so I thought I would just travel down there and see myself because I'd never thought of it from that angle. And the surprise, the biggest surprise for me was the house that I had been told was Wathen's house was not where it was. Believe it or not, um, I drove up to the place where I thought it was, and I knew that Wathen's house had burned. I had yeah. stumbled across yeah, that. About 2000 uh, that happened about 2000 and I drove up to the house that I was told was Wathen's house and I actually knocked on the door and the, this guy comes out he was a um, I guess you'd call him an amateur historian he was yeah. fascinated with Wathen's history and he says no this isn't Wathen's house but I know exactly where it is and I'll drive you there <laughs> and so we we drove up there and he gave me a little bit of history, some of which I knew, some of which I did not know. And because he was an amateur historian, I obviously had to fact check what he said. But I started taking this video that you can see in the background if you're watching the YouTube feed. And I'm, I'm literally standing on the hill at Wathen's place. And I start panning around to where I can see the river. And I keep going, and there's this huge land mass in between the hill and the bridge. So there's mm -hmm. absolutely no way no. he could have ever seen it, right? No, no, it, it, it's, it's miles away from the bridge. It's, miles and miles away. Even so, if there wasn't anything in between, I mean, it's so far. You, yeah. I don't even know if you could see it with binoculars. The distance well, is so great. Well, I did some experimentation. So... Um, first, let me tell you a little bit about the history that he gave me. This was, it actually used to be, it wasn't just a house as we think of it today. This was the mansion and it was yeah. on the Wathen Farms. It was actually called Riverview Farms. And behind the, the mansion, there was a horse track where you could gamble on the horse races. I did not realize that it was right there. Mm. And there was the stables, you know, for the horses, for the races. He was like a, a pleasure paradise kind of man. He, he had Absolutely. his hands in all of the, uh, what would you call it? The uh, the the uh, pleasures of life. Yes. <laughs> the things to attract the, the pleasure seekers of the day. He, he had it all and had his hands in it all. Right. So here is the liquor kingpin, the guy that Al Capone literally comes to see in Jeffersonville. This is the big man in the... Marvel Universe, this is the kingpin, right? This is the big one. And on the grounds of this place where everybody is, you know, working the casinos and the liquor and the industries, right on these grounds is William Branham and his family. Right. And he's if, got some, he's got uh, like some houses in his backyard yes. where, where his key workers, Wathen's key workers live. And Branham's family lives in one of these homes on his on his land. Yeah, 
it's a huge, huge place, right? Yeah. I know it. Um, I had seen this house many times. I take my boat, you know, right past this all the time. It's at a place called Duffy's Landing. And Duffy's Landing is a very old, broken down marina. It's still used. People back their boats into it, but all the docks are, you know, falling apart. But the house used to be owned by a Mr. Duffy. And then uh, Richard Wathen bought the house and Otto Wathen lived on the Duffy mansion. It was called Riverview Farms. And all of his casino and liquor workers lived on the grounds when William Branham's family lived on the grounds. Right. It was like a. You know, you'd almost call it a, a compound, almost, right? Like exactly, it, it's a self-contained little compound with all of the men and tools and resources to run his little criminal ring uh, in the Jeffersonville, Louisville area. And I've got to dig it up. I've not had time yet to do this to confirm, but this is a puzzle piece that I did not have. I am almost positive I have seen Charles saying that he worked as a laborer on a farm of some sort. So he was on the grounds, which makes sense. He lives there, which right? Which is true. And he said, and 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 he also said uh, in his recordings that his father's farm was on Utica Pike, which yes. is where's Mr. Wathen's house? Utica, Utica Pike. Pike, right? It's yep. the same place. Yeah. Yeah. And back then, it wasn't part of Jeffersonville. It was no. just. You know, just, uh, just outside to the, the side city of, limits. Right. And uh, I'm almost positive I also saw, I think it was his brother Jesse, worked on the horse track. Um, I've got to look that up. I think he even, William Brown may have mentioned that on, on recording. But anyway, I did some experimentation. So he says he's on the hill and he looks and he sees where the bridge is built. I did some experimentation, and obviously there's this landmass. There's no way possible he could have seen it. So I walked all the way down to the river, and this would have pre-existed some of the things that are there today. So I just stayed on the bank, and I looked. There's still, you might have seen maybe a millimeter in your sight's view of the end of the bridge on the Louisville side, because... The bridge spans, and then the river curves, and you cannot see even, you know, if he I saw it, it was just such a little tiny piece, and his eyes would have had to have been like Superman's eyes, you're, right? You're exactly, you're exactly right. The, the river takes a very sharp bend at Jeffersonville, and Wathen's house is way up the bend. Right. And, and even, even, if, even if it wasn't on a bend, I mean, that is, I think that's at least four miles there, John. Right. And and there's just no it, it the way what the way I always learned I heard Brother Branham's story growing up you know on 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 the tape that I listened to he he always said I was standing right on the bank of the river right there by the river and I looked out and I saw the bridge come up out of the river and here on that exact same spot mm-hmm. that bridge was built and there's just no way that that's true and I know that that's exactly what you were looking at when you when you went up there yeah so here is the experiment that I did. So back then it was River Riverview Farms, and what is a public Duffy's Landing now, back then was part of Riverview Farms. So there was no need to have all of the docks for public boating to go up there. However, docks now exist, and I walked out onto the docks. So I'm, st- I'm literally standing on top of the river where William Branham could not have stood, and interestingly, there was a person there with black skin who was very surprised to hear that in Jeffersonville, this whole clan operation created this church that everybody in Jeff- Jeffersonville is familiar with. So I asked him, do you mind if I stand here next to you while you're fishing? And he said, yes. So I did some video recording to show the viewers that you can see the bridge right there, just a faint hint of it. But there, the um, remember, there's other bridges there. There is the bridge that actually was the you know the bridge where men fell, and then if you look beyond this, now there there are two bridges in between that did not exist at that time. Beyond that, the bridge also is at a different angle, so it's it's angled away from your view. And the, it's. Yeah, and it's probably a little easier to see nowadays because they painted it yellow about, right, what, right. two or three years ago? 
Right. I don't think it was historically yellow. I mean, it was always kind of a blue gray for. Yeah, it was. It started. Right. It's probably so it, even unfinished. You know, to begin yeah, with. Yeah. Yeah. So that yellow will maybe mm-hmm. help it pop a little bit there in your picture. Right. But you're right. There, even if he was looking that way, there would at that day would have been another bridge in the mm-hmm. way, right. blocking the view. Um, right. So. And, yeah. There's no way he. So. I'm standing on the water where he cannot stand unless, you know, there are followers that claim that this man is just like Jesus Christ. Maybe they believe he walked out on the water, right? <laughs> that <laughs> could be, John. The, the only way you can see it. So then I did the opposite experiment. I went all the way to the, um, I went on to the first bridge that you see there, not the actual bridge of the prophecy, but the first bridge that's obstructing the view. Yeah, I and saw I, that picture. I did the reverse view and I'm looking like line of sight where where it matched the end on the Louisville side of the municipal bridge. Cannot see Duffy's landing. I mean, with a pair of binoculars I might have seen just a little hint of it. So all of this said, I mean that was that was exciting, but that's actually not the exciting part. As I'm standing there on the hill and I'm starting to piece all of these things together, I'm realizing, number one, I'm standing where the liquor kingpin, the basically the Jeffersonville mob kingpin lived. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm looking at the grounds where all of the mob henchmen lived mm-hmm. and suddenly realizing, wait a minute, this isn't what I pictured when I'm, I'm hearing all of these wonderful childhood stories. No. And the thought suddenly occurred to me, the timeline that we've been given was incorrect. We, we found this out on the last yeah. few episodes yeah. and I started in my head. It just suddenly hit me. I cannot believe I never realized this, but there was a point in time, which we'll get later into the episode. Whenever the clan raids Jeffersonville, the still, the whiskey still where they're running this illegal liquor operation to supply the car. Chicago mob gets basically taken down by the Klan and William Branham, who was working that still was of age that he could have and probably should have been convicted. And according to his sermons, he left town. So, so I want to examine that in this episode. That's why we've inserted this episode because this is significant. It would mean literally that his ministry started because he was running from the law. It's an interesting th- concept, John, and you're definitely right. We're going to get into some evidence here uh, as we as we look at this line of thought. And, uh, you know, we have certain facts that are undeniable. And before we'll get through this, we'll look at all those facts. And it's it's very definite. William Branham was involved in something in these years he did not want us to know about. Right. Uh, his story does not match what's in all of his uh, biographies. What happened in these years? So I, I'm I'm excited, John, to talk about this a little more. So so you take the lead. Well, and it makes sense too, right? Because I've, as I showed in the video of the last episode, if you're listening on on our audio feeds, you can go watch the video. But I showed the basically the tour guide that is given by the cult. Wathen's place is not on it. And that was another thing that that just made my curiosity alerts go off. Why right. in the world did they not? This is a significant yes. part of his life. Yeah, that's really true because he's always very clear in his stories that they live in Wathen's backyard. And he even gives the the street and everything where, he, where they're living at through all of those years. And they live there a good almost 20 years, John, right, in, yeah. Wath, in Wathen's backyard. And and. It, why wouldn't they take people there? This is where the vid- bridge vision w- really happened. This is where the angel uh, spoke to him, uh, don't defile your body or any of this stuff. All of this happened in this, in Wathen's backyard, right? Yeah. So why don't they take people there? That's a good question. What don't they want people to see or realize from that spot? What are they hiding? I mean, think of it. This, again, like in the Spider-Man universe, this is the kingpin. In this type of world, in this criminal world, what you see publicly is not what's really going on. They have a farm. People are working the farm. They've got a racetrack. But they have this massive liquor operation running under the, you know, behind the scenes. Right. Even the years that William Branham can and his family can place into the history books or phone records, um, 
you know, a, another house, that doesn't mean that they actually were living and operating in that house. They could have still been on this Wathen farm running right. this thing, but let's get to the history because I think we'll, we'll, um, show that uh, this is a much deeper connection than people realize. Sure. So, um, as I said, the house was built by Captain James Duffy, and uh, his daughter married into the Wathen family. Duffy had family in Chicago, which is another one of these strange Chicago connections, which we'll explore as we go on in, into the series. But um, So Duffy's family married into the Wathen family, and there was also, I, I noticed some people with the last name of Howard, which is really weird if you look at the evidence, because... William Branham had a brother named Howard Duffy Branham. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's, it's a strange coincidence that I can't, you know, I can't really say anything other than that's really odd. But the, um, this, this place, this um, Riverview Farms is what supplied the Chicago mob with liquor. And this was during Prohibition. So if you watch the movies where... You know, you've got the old gangsters and whatnot. They, there were still, they were still able to produce liquor legally at his factory using a medicinal license. Right. And according to what was reported to the government, at least from what I saw in the newspapers, because it's condensed down to only medicinal purposes, I think he only had like six workers in the actual distillery right right yeah the the prohibition has nearly shut down his uh above board business right right and uh but he's taking some things underground right john right right so he's taking everything underground and oh one one other interesting thing i forgot to mention when i was talking about the strange things the wathen family was from marion county kentucky and William Branham, whose legal name was William Marvin Branham, whenever he chose a fake name, he chose William Marion Branham, which is another weird connection. I can't say that they're directly related, but this is really odd. Right. And we also know uh, one. Some, there was a marriage between the Wathens and William Branham's family as well, too, right? Uh, I think, right. Uh, yeah, so there, there is different connections, family connections between these two groups. And they were, they were, they were very friendly. They were, they were very close over the years. The two families, the Wathens and the Branhams. Yeah, definitely. And so let's paint the scene a little bit. Before the 1937 flood just demolished Jeffersonville, this was like you had mentioned. This was a play place. This was called Little Las Vegas. It was nicknamed Little Las Vegas, and. They had the horse track. They also had this Greyhound track, which is fascinating history because um, I've, I've seen it. Right now, there's a motorcycle shop, but it used to be Greyhound uh, Grocery Store, I think it was called, and that was basically where the tracks were. Right. And that's very, that's about, that's from the Tabernacle to Wathen's house. It's in between there. Uh, yeah. Well, actually, it's a little bit. It's a little bit uh, north. You go up I-65 north, and it's on the Clarksville side. But what's interesting is they race greyhounds, and as a gimmick that just brought all kinds of crowds, they would put little monkeys on the back of the greyhounds as jockeys. Oh, yeah. I've seen those pictures. And yeah, it's, it's, it's unbelievable. Um, so it, it brought all kinds of you know entertainment into this area. And all the while, they had the casino on Spring Street in Jeffersonville. Right. Um, actually, a row of casinos. They're right. not what we picture today because Vegas has painted this picture in our mind of casinos as this massive, massive monolithic structure. But these were old-timey little buildings that were just small casinos, right? Right. Right. And we had Rose Island off to the other kind of right on the river there in town. Right. Big amusement park. Uh, then they had their pleasure cruises up and down the river. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it was a completely different world than what we see today. Right. And so in the, in the life stories, William Branham talks about his making whiskey for Wath, for, for Charles Branham, which I learned later was essentially making it for Wathen. But the picture that he paints in your mind is that he was this small child who was 
oh my gosh, I didn't have a childhood. I had to carry water, which may have been true. Who knows? But when even the coloring books that the cult headquarters puts out for children are coloring books depicting a small child who is filling these whiskey stills. And on, I'm going to be honest, that has that basically prevented me from going down this research for almost a decade now. Right. Because in my mind, they've painted this picture that isn't quite true. And how it, it now when he started with his father, I'm sure he was a little tight, right? Helped Maybe, do, right? But by the time we get to the day that the clan shows up and is shutting down the stills and his dad's going to jail, William Branham's not a little tight anymore no. on that day. No. No. He's, according to the newspaper, you know, there. this was a big clan raid. The, the uh, Ku Klux Klan had a newsletter. A newspaper in Indianapolis because, again, they were the largest Klan operation in the United States. Right. And they were bragging about how the Klan went in, raided Jeffersonville, and basically shut down this illegal whiskey ring or liquor ring. I got a copy of it right here, John, if you wanted to put yeah. it up for the people. And this, the, the Klan runs this, uh, this newspaper article where they tell that they've come to Jeffersonville, they have uh, cleaned up the Jeffersonville booze ring, uh, shut it down, the people arrested, uh, and John, this is happening in March 1924. March, March 1924. 1924. March 1924. Yep. And so, the Klan comes in, they raid. Now, if you look at the other newspaper evidence that we have... There was later identified, uh, or maybe it's previously identified, Wathen was continuously using private individuals to, to basically produce liquor that he could illegally run to Chicago and Cincinnati mobs. Right, right. And, and, and when the newspaper talks about the Jeffersonville booze ring, we're talking about Wathen and, and his operation, right? That's the only, it's, that's who it is, right? Yeah. And, and you're right. Uh, the Wathen and his group are the booze ring that is supplying um, Al Capone and his, his operations in Chicago. And I, got, I, I did get ahead and get another one, John. There's oh, yeah. all kinds of newspaper articles. <laughs> I just kind of printed off just a few of the key ones. But here's yeah. one of, of many that talk about Wathen um, being caught in the dry net. Uh, of the investigators when he when his group was involved in supplying liquor to Capone in Chicago right and that's what this yeah. is this, they, they've they've intercepted shipments they've traced it back to the people connected to Wathen and Wathen and his family and his connected people are all being indicted mm -hmm. uh, in, in that newspaper article right and Again, there's so many, when we find one puzzle piece, it connects so many others. <clears throat> when I was first looking at this, I, I, know, I knew some of this from years ago, but the distilleries themselves, a lot of the distilleries are in Kentucky on the Louisville, you know, past Louisville into Lexington. There's a whole array of distilleries. So when I'm thinking about Wathen supplying the Chicago mob and the medicinal whiskey, my my mind was basically placing all of this going on in Louisville, but that Fiery Cross article that you reference right there, right. it basically says that the, the liquor raids were in Jeffersonville. So while they've got the distilleries on the Louisville side and this big operation's going on in Jeffersonville, the Klan just basically cleaned house. And and I'll, I'll throw this in for our uh, listeners, too, just a little bit of historical note. So Indiana and Kentucky are two separate states, right? Right. And historically, uh, in, through the 1800s and even up into this early 1900s, it was not easy to have someone extradited across state lines, John. Right. So uh, a part of the reason, right, so I would live on one side of the river maybe and do my criminal operation on the other side – uh, I, I have a very easy getaway, right? Because when, when the police chase you, they have to stop at the river, right? And so you when you get across state lines in those days, it, it you've escaped, basically. Right. So you've got a quick, easy escape when you live right on the state line. And that is no, no doubt why these people were living right on the state line. 
and also no doubt why there was a basically a dock a boat dock right there right you know this this was the way that you cross the river very quickly and this was no small operation when you think about you know again the picture that was painted in my mind of what the way William Branham presented it I was a small child and my dad had this liquor still and he threw parties and there were, he even talks about I mean, he's basically hinting at an orgy at his father still, and that's why he says he hates his father. But yeah, this and was women too. <laughs> yeah, women. This was not a this was not a small operation. In nineteen, no. what was it? Nineteen twenty, I think they were the Wathen Liquor Ring was caught transporting one thousand cases of liquor. Right, right, and you're 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 spot on, John. There's tons of liquor moving through there, and and you're right, William Branham. William Branham told us these things on tape. I mean, so we're we're not even really saying anything he didn't say here. He pretty well no. told us point blank there were prostitutes on that property. Mm-hmm. He told us they were making vast quantities of whiskey on that property and he was helping them do the whiskey, right? And and when you when when you know all that's there and you realize he's saying um in his life story that this is where the angel comes to him and said, "Now, don't ever drink or defile right. your body in any way and all of this stuff," right? He was surrounded <laughs> by whiskey and prostitutes <laughs> and all of this stuff where he was living right there in the middle of it. And, and I, you know, and again, I'm not saying he indulged in any of that, right? But it, it, it just adds up why he even felt like he needs to say, I was not involved. I never did right. any of this stuff, right? Because the angel told me not to, right? <laughs> yeah, and and also, you know, his timeline, which we're going to explore the reasons why here in a minute, but his timeline fluctuates so greatly. Sometimes he's he's very young when this alleged angel met him and said to basically stay disconnected from all of this stuff. Right. The newspaper article, I had, I had not caught it. You're the one that, that showed this to me, even though my website has the newspaper article. He was 16 years old when he got arrested. Right, right. 16 years old. Right, John. And and what I will uh one one really awesome thing about your website and your listeners, you don't got to take our word for all of this, right? Like all of the newspapers are on your article. I've just got a couple, I got one more to show, but there there are hundreds of these and and yeah. they're all on your website and out in chronological order. You can just sit down and start reading these articles in chronological order one by one. This is what I did, John, because I didn't believe anything you said a few years ago. Right. So I sat down and I read all of these newspaper articles myself because I thought you're you're out of your mind, right? But no, you, this these stories are just just read in the newspapers you come up with this stuff. I mean, it, and it's so obvious when you read it. And you're right, John. The newspaper said that William... So when this happened, when the Klan attacks Jeffersonville and they shut down the booze operation ring, which Wathen and his family was running on the Wathen farm in Jeffersonville, William Branham, right, was 16 years old. Yes. 16 years old, also according to the newspaper articles. And here is just one of a series of articles about William Branham and what's happening with his family also in March 1924, right. which I'll will talk to maybe just a little bit more about that one as we get going along, John. Yeah, I'm well, I mean even to paint the picture, let's let's pause and let's do that because think of this. You've got this was for people who aren't in the United States listening to this. The Ku Klux Klan was a domestic terrorist organization they were vigilantes they were armed they were militant right if you did something that violated one of their principles you were you were at risk of death you were at risk of men with white hoods with rifles coming and and killing you and what's interesting about that article is it's not only william branham who's injured there are others in his family that are suffering. Right. And 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 right before I show this article, let me ma- throw in one other thing. So who were the leaders of the mob? What was their religion, John? <laughs> they were Catholics. They were Catholic, <laughs> right? So yes. not only were they boozers, they were Catholics. These were the clan's arch enemy, okay? Okay? The heads of the clan, the heads of the mob were Catholic. Capone was Catholic. We've been looking into Wathen trying to confirm, but it looks like he was Catholic too. And William Branham and his family, what were they? So there we have a question. 
okay? Because mm-hmm. William Branham's told so many different stories. You know, in, 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 one time he's talking about, he says, well, my family was all Catholic. Another right. time he tells it, my family was all Baptist, right? Another time he tells it, well, my family wasn't nothing, right? Right. So what, which what I don't know, right? But in, in at least one of his many versions, his family's all Catholic too, right? Yeah. And, and so they're Catholic. They're working with Catholics who are helping Catholics who are sending liquor up to the mob. So it's entirely possible, and it, it's hard to say, it's entirely possible his family was also Catholic at, at that time too. Yeah. Um, but at any rate, yes, John, you're, you're right. So March in March 1924, the Klan attacks Jeffersonville. They it, it's spelled out in this article the things that they've done. The Jeffersonville booze ring, which is ran by Wathen, is shut down. Multiple people arrested. The Klan has taken responsibility. And this article in their in their newspaper, they're they're bragging up what they've done. Yeah. And so. We, we we have very solid evidence that that happened in Jeffersonville in March 1924. Well, in March 1924, here's here's one other article. Family asked for aid. This is one of multiple newspaper articles that that ran in the Jeffersonville Evening News in the month of March, and this is but this one is a key one. And what this one tells us is that at the same time that Charles Branham has been arrested for his liquor activities, right? And and this is also March 1924. Right. Charles right. Branham has been arrested for his liquor activities. We know he was living on with Wathen when the Klan attacked, right? At the same time that has happened, William Branham has been shot in both legs. Another son has suffered a broken arm. And another son has sustained a life threatening injury as well uh, to his neck. So not only has Charles Branham been arrested and put in jail, three of his sons have also been severely and life-threateningly injured at the exact same time that this has happened. And William Branham, according to uh, not this article, but I I actually don't have that one printed. It's one in the series right before this, John. Um, it says that William Branham was 16 years old. And actually, I might have that one printed here. John, let me look real quick. So this is another one in these series, and this one is talking specifically about William Branham and his father. Yes. And here they say, in this one, that William Branham was 16 years old in March 1924 when this event happened. So 16 John, years old. So you can start maybe connecting that, John, into <laughs> why somebody would need to disappear or or run away or change their age. Yes. Uh, so that that is literally the bomb that is dropping in this episode. I have I have spent a decade of research trying to find out two things. Number one, why was William Branham dishonest about his entire history from childhood to ministry? Why would somebody why would somebody do that, especially a Christian minister? Why would a Christian minister be dishonest about his entire conversion story to Christ? Christians don't do this, right? And number two, why did all of the years change? His birth year, according to every record that we've identified up to a certain date, places his birth at 1907. He himself mentions being born in 1907 on recording. He says, John Alexander Dowie died on this day, and I was born the next day, which is 1907. Later, that's the, basically, that's his Elijah stage persona. Right. Dowie, Dowie's Elijah, and he's getting the Elisha to Dowie's Elijah. Whenever he was, he was telling his Moses stage persona, he says, that he met this fortune teller, and this fortune teller told him, did you know you're born under a sign? The stars and the planets aligned in 1909. Yet, one of his marriage records, I believe it's the one to hope, he says that he's born in 1908. So we have three birth years for the man. And who does this, right? Even the argument that has been made towards William Branham's favor is, well, they didn't have records today like we have, you know, back then like we have today, so he didn't know his age. But what people don't understand is during that era when you did not have records, even if you didn't remember your birth year, 
you picked one and you stuck with it because this is a this identifies you it's part of your identity right the question that was raised for me was why would somebody try to hide their identity yeah yeah why why and with him he he changed the year and he also changed the day of the month and the month uh, in some of the birthdays as well so yeah it, it's always been it's an unusual thing right like why did he do it and and for me i had always looked at it john that he was doing it for the effect of his stage personas right so he right. needed to have this date so he could claim to be the successor of dowie and elijah right and but then he needed this other date because it's what the fortune teller told him uh, in relation to him getting the two signs as moses so right. he just kind of juggled whichever one fit at the what story he was telling but as we look at these things john you know at age 16 in indiana at that time that's enough to be tried as an adult it in is court, right john it is i was standing on that hill and i was looking around at all these properties you know when he talks about his you know he tells these humble beginning stories and i'm looking around trying to envision what it would have looked like none of it exists today even wathan's house is burned to the ground but I mean, picture this. This was where the horse track was. This was where the casino basically was. This was where most of the money in Jeffersonville was. This was the kingpin in Jeffersonville. So this would have been a very extravagant place. And I'm picturing the clan coming in and raiding not just Charles Branham's whiskey still, which I believe was actually off grounds, which makes sense. They're hiding the operation. But when they raid Jeffersonville, they're not just raiding these off-ground sites. This is the kingpin. This is their target, right? And I'm, it, the thought suddenly hit me, and that's when I called you. You know, William Branham says, I'm going to read the quote, actually, because we know exactly how old he was when he was shot. It's in the newspapers, age 16. Yeah. He says, I was shot down in the field when I was 14 years old and I was laying there my legs blowed over me like hamburger from a 12 gauge shotgun I screamed for water oh give me a drink now if you if you think about this like you just said he's 16 years old in that era 16 was the age of adulthood everybody considered you an adult when you're 16 not when you're 14 and even today, in the state of Indiana, at age 16, you can be tried as an adult if you have an offense severe enough to be tried as an adult, which back then, this was a federal law that he was breaking. Yeah. So what we have, John, is really um, what looks like the first possible reason that William Branham, the first possible time William Branham may have needed to change his birth date to avoid being tried as that adult, John. Yes. And... Uh, he, if he was 16 years old when his father was arrested, right, then in the eyes of the law, he was just as guilty as his dad for walk, working those stills. And he should have went to jail just as much as his dad should have Absolutely. for what was going on there at that time, right? And so we have a very logical explanation for why he would change his birthday at this time, and it is to avoid... Uh, going to jail with his father uh, because we know from his own testimony he was right there with his dad working in the illegal production of liquor. Yes. And these newspaper articles tell us he was at an age to be tried as an adult when that happened. Yes. Now, I, I can hear it now. All of the pro-William Branham people are going to say, you don't know that's why he changed his name or changed his, his birth year. Right. We don't. We don't know that. We, no. we can't say for certain that this is why he lied about no. his birth year, but we know that there is some reason why he lied about his birth year, and this looks like the most plausible explanation. Right, exactly. You know, we, we don't know all of the hows. We don't know all of the whys, but we know it happened, right? And yeah. that that's the thing. And, and here's here's what uh, I hope the listeners don't do, right? Don't... Um, don't get so stuck on trying to figure out the how and the why that you miss the facts, okay? Right. The fact is uh, that William Branham was involved in this stuff. There, there's, certain, um, there's certain facts here. And, John, I, I just want to 
run down these things. These are indisputable facts. Um, number one is Branham's father did work for Otto Wathen. William Branham said so himself. Mm-hmm. Wathen was the supplier of Al Capone's bootlegging operations. Indisputable. We, we know that through government records, through newspaper articles. Three, Branham told his audiences that he was working on those stills with his father in the sale production of liquor, right? There's right. not that that's a fact. And in March of nineteen twenty four, his father was arrested for those criminal activities. And also, number five, the Klan attacked Jeffersonville that same month and shut down the booze ring in Jeffersonville, which his right. father was working in. Right? Number six, William Branham was involved in the firearms accident at the exact same time shot in both legs, and two of his brothers also suffered life-threatening injuries at the same time. Number six and number seven, the Indiana clan then steps in. They pay William Branham's hospital expenses, right? So these are all, everything I've just said is facts with no speculation whatsoever. None. And when, and when, when you add all of that up, right, there's got to be an explanation here. And if you summed it up, you could say what is happening in this story in these times is not what William Branham has led us to believe. It is not what is in this book. No. It is not what is in this book. It is not what is in this book. What is happening here in his life is not what is in these books, right? Right. And whatever happened, whatever happened, when you come out to the other side of this event, William Branham is taken under the wings of the Ku Klux Klan, and he's touring the nation with the second highest ranking member of the Klan. Right. So for the listeners who aren't watching the video, um, the books that were shown are all the cults supported life story accounts that are published. This is how you know William Branham. But I'm going to add, uh, you mentioned eight points. I'm going to add, or seven points. I'm going to add eight, nine, and ten. Go ahead. Which are extremely significant, extremely significant. There are going to be pro-William Branham supporters who say, well, this may have been disconnected. Yes, Wathen was the kingpin. Yes, Charles was producing liquor. But what if Charles wasn't producing liquor for Wathen at that time? What if he went rogue and he's out on his own and he's producing liquor and William Branham is helping fund, you know, feed the liquor stills, regardless of William Branham being dishonest about his birth year? Well, we have a newspaper article where when Charles is arrested... Wathen actually pays his bail. Right. 1924. So that connects it all back together to Wathen. Right. But here's the bigger thing. Whenever this happens, you know, the Klan has raided with vigilante justice. They've raided Jeffersonville. And vigilante justice in the United States isn't, isn't really legal. It's outside of the scope of the law. It can only be, remember this was an Indiana clan, so it's a state vigilante. But here's what it did. Whenever the clan raided Jeffersonville and exposed this big operation that was going, the clan had no intent of seeing that through to its end. What they did was they opened the doors for the government to investigate to see what was going on, and then the government would see this through to its conclusion. I had missed this, even though, believe it or not, this was on my website, and I did not notice the dates were different. Charles Branham actually went to prison for this. More than and, once, even. Yeah, well, he went to jail once, but he actually went to the state prison for this. Right, right. Right, and it was three years later. Mm-hmm. It was, what was the date? I think it was 1927. He went to federal prison. Right. So we're talking about a three-year span of government investigation into the Jeffersonville liquor ring that William Branham and Charles Branham are participating in. Right, right. And and just, again, William Branham was a minor when he started. Mm-hmm. But before this is over with, Branham is a adult. He go, yes. he crosses the line, and he's an adult at a certain point that he's working in this operation. And what year do you think that William Branham fled Jeffersonville? 
Well, the <clears throat> the official version and the best I think I say 1927. Just so I'm going to read. I'm going to read a quote that's going to blow your mind because this is. I've been trying to find the reason for this trip uh, for ten years. I kid you not. For ten years, I've been trying to find this puzzle piece, and we just found it in this episode. I'm going to read you this quote from William Branham. I was passing down this street. I came here for the first time 35 years ago this year. He's in Phoenix, Arizona, and he is describing his, um, his trip out west. And he says, I was passing through here 35 years ago this year in 1926 in an old T model Ford. 1926. Now that doesn't mean that he left Jeffersonville in 1926. That means he was in Phoenix in 1926. Mm -hmm. And we already know that he is working with Roy Davis by 1926. Right. Sure seems that so way. it looks very much like the clan raided Jeffersonville. At some point after this, William Branham changes his birth year. He basically decreases his year by two years to become 14 instead of 16. He starts working with Roy Davis and the Indiana uh, clan and, you know, the Davis clan, etc., and then changes the... So at, at the early part of his life, he's changing the date backwards. So he's subtract... You know, he's basically subtracting two years off of his life. Then, to cover this up, he's, he claims that his ministry starts about 19... What was it, 1931, 32, something like this? Yeah, 32, 33, he, somewhere. He's a little vague about it, but it's way after 1926. So right. he is literally, we know that he is in the ministry with Davis, and he's touring with Roy Davis, the Imperial Chaplain, um, Caleb Ridley. Caleb Ridley. Mm -hmm. He literally right. goes in bed with the Klan to escape prosecution. Right. And so, you know, as we look at it, as we look at it, there's there's something unusual that happens there. And I know I think I've alluded to this before in another episode that we where we looked at this. It, it seems like William Branham, in a sense, changes sides here. Something this this event where he shot in both legs, the Klan comes and pays his hospital bill. It's some big catalyst in his life, a moment where something really changes in his life. And <sighs> It, it seems like when you come out to the other side of this, again, we don't we don't necessarily understand the how or the why. He ends up working, like you said, with these high-ranking members of the Ku Klux Klan. Um, did they did they take him under his wing and say, "Oh, we're sorry, we shot you. Come, we'll help you"? Did they? Was he with them all along? Uh, was he on their side the day? You know, this, we don't exactly know, but something happens. After this right. event, where the shooting, he shot, where his dad goes to jail, and he has a he has a reason to run from the law because he was certainly involved in crime, right? The crime he should have went to jail for. Something happens, and he starts working with these Klan figures uh, and leaves the state of Indiana. Yeah, see, my mind goes a slightly different direction. I I can see your. I can see your point, and that's probably, you know, that's probably the most plausible fact. But I grew up in this strange world as William Branham cult elite family where the actuality of what happened is so far compl more complicated than the public view of what happened. Whenever my family gave a public presence, there was always so much more going on behind the scenes that you could literally say any one of the spider web of trails of actual truth and only give partial truth. Roy Davis, um, this was a man who was a criminal. We have a, an extensive criminal record history of him. The Klan was in the public, was opposed to liquor, was opposed to the mob. They were fully disconnected, and they were vigilantes against this sort of thing. Right. The rank and file was, was anti-liquor, right? Right. But you've got this weird scenario. Davis is a criminal. He's right. basically against every value that the vigilantes were trying to stop. Exactly. He was a personally opposed to prohibition, right? Right, He, he right. supported liquor Davis. 
He supported liquor. He's working with Congressman William D. Upshaw, literally the man that is the reason why prohibition exists in the United States. Right. But then uh, Davis on the side is what? He's got his Sargon juice where he's selling yeah. his yeah. off-brand Upshaw. liquor, right? Upshaw, yeah, yeah Upshaw. Up, Upshaw is selling liquor for, he's basically rebranding and he calls it a, quote, revitalizer. Yeah. But it's, it's a right. liquor, right? So these men, they did not hold to their core values. And right. he, even in Indiana, D.C. Stevenson, we talked about the Grand Dragon before. Yes. They were he was publicly in support of prohibition, but guess he what? He was drunk the day that he <laughs> murdered yes. the woman in Indianapolis. Right? None of them. Uh, the leaders were definitely uh, not opposed to drinking liquor. It was a it was a public. Uh, it was just a public public image they were trying to hold up for their rank and file. Right? And what wasn't Caleb Ridley? Didn't he get? And oh yeah, some Ca- trouble for drinking. Caleb Ridley was a drunk too. He got arrested for DUI in Georgia, right? So all all of these top people in the Klan, John, all of them are drinking liquor, right? Um, and they're just kind of riding that wave of power, right? And so so it makes sense to me why the leaders like Roy Davis and stuff they would look at William Branham and maybe feel sorry for him, right? Because yeah. they don't really see anything wrong with what he was doing. In fact. They might have been some of his customers, <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> for all so, we know. Right. So where my mind goes with this, in being raised in the cult, especially if you're a rank-and-file member, not like my family was, you see William Branham as this big mastermind. This, you know, He's this evil entity that ruined and destroyed your life, so you're going to think he's the, the prime villain. I don't see it like that. I don't see him as a pawn. But he was basically one of the enforcers. He, Davis, and these men above him were pulling his strings. And think of the criminality that's going on behind the scenes. Think of Davis, who is a criminal. Now you've got William Branham, who literally knows the intricate details of the mob because he grew up right there in the Wathen house on the Wathen farm. This guy knows how it works, right? Plus, he also has connections that were established while living there. Whenever you are this type of criminal, the way that criminals think, people aren't people. People are resources to manipulate other people. So Davis would have... Branham would have been a prime target to get so that he could get at other people and also to as ways to basically, you know, if he's in bed with the mob and he gets in trouble himself, which he did several times, he can easily go say, hey, look, we're working with you. Can you get me out of this thing? And I'll rub your back if you rub mine, right? I see this as a golden opportunity for Davis and for some of the others in the clan. You know, there's there's so many possibilities, right? And a lot of them are really very plausible. And right. however it comes about, William Branham definitely comes from living in this mob-controlled, liquor-producing, gambling, prostitution compound, right? right? Moves from there over, and he's touring and traveling with the some of the top ranking leaders of the Ku Klux Klan. And this happens right after mm-hmm. these events where he shot, his father goes to jail, and his brothers also suffer life-threatening injuries, right? It all happens, yeah. boom, 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 right at the same time. Think of this. Al Capone, they were never able to stop him. He was, I mean, this was the kingpin in Chicago. He was a villain beyond what we can even imagine. Even with everything going on, they they could not pin him to any single crime. He was that level of, you know, beyond untouchable for the law. The only way that they could stop him was through a tax evasion lawsuit. That's how they arrested Al Capone. And what did William Branham have in the middle of his ministry? A tax evasion lawsuit. That's true, you know. John. <clears throat> William Branham was charged with tax evasion, uh, and he was guilty, actually, because he, he, he admitted his guilt, right? And he right. settled the whole thing out of court uh, and just admitted he was liable for the whole thing. Mm-hmm. And 
you know, uh, I, I'm sure we're going to get more into those things as we get deeper into his ministry. But I know we've, we've in these first episodes, we have not got out of the 1920s yet, John. I know. <laughs> There's so much here. We, we, you know, and I know uh, maybe some people listen to this. Why, why are you still stuck here? And this event, you know, it's a huge question as to how and why did William Branham start down this path? And part of this is we want our listeners to see that there was something uh, ugly happening behind the scenes all the way back here at the very beginning, right? Right. Just like it, it, This isn't something that started way down the road in his ministry. This was from the beginning. So that's an important fact that is conveyed by these things. Uh, another thing is um, that we want to understand why, right? That's the hugest. Why did he do this? Why? Why, 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 why? Everybody that's come out of the message, everybody that's, that's who has, like me, John, like you, our lives were terribly affected by the things that William Branham did. William Branham caused us incredible pain and suffering. And we lived through that and endured that. And we want to know, why? Why did he do this, right? And did he have a good motive and, and or was it a bad motive, right? We want to understand. And, and this lays a little bit of a groundwork for us yeah. to start to understand why. And, and we're not so much maybe talking about those whys, but our listeners definitely can take these facts and, and put some pieces together for themselves uh, to, to see some of those whys. Why did he do mm. this? I think that's a really good way to say it because this episode in of itself isn't incriminating. This basically explains the reasons why what we're about to get into in future episodes, the reasons why these things happen. This is, in my world, I call this a Lego block. As you're building the house of Legos, you've got all of these little blocks, and without some of the more important blocks, the house won't stand. So this is one of the most fundamental Lego blocks of this building that we're creating, right? And there's so much to get into, but we've got to stop it here. And um, next week we're going to get into some more of these building blocks. And it's such exciting information that, I mean, it, my mind is already being blown. I don't know about the listeners, but this this was fascinating research. If you've enjoyed our show and you want more information, you can check us out on the web. You can find us at william-branham.org and christiangospelchurch.org. For an overview of the historical information and research of William Branham and the healing revivals, you can read Preacher Behind the White Hoods, a critical examination of William Branham and his message, available on Amazon, Kindle, and Audible. And join us again next week. We've got a great episode ahead. 